there is a speed limit in the sky. It isn't written by the FAA, and it isn't enforced by the police. It is enforced by the laws of physics. For decades, aviation engineers believed that a helicopter could only fly so fast before it tore itself apart. They believed that if you pushed a rotor wing past 200 miles per hour, the aerodynamics would become so violent, so chaotic, that the machine would simply fall out of the sky. But in the mid-1960s, at a secret facility in California, one company decided to break that law. They didn't just want to build a faster helicopter, they wanted to build a monster. They wanted a machine that could hover like a hummingbird, fly as fast as a wobbly woi twee fighter plane, and carry an arsenal that could level a small city. They wanted to create the ultimate predator. They succeeded. They built a machine so advanced that on paper it looked like alien technology compared to the Hueys flying in Vietnam. It shattered every speed record on the books. It could do things that pilots swore were impossible. It was a technological marvel that promised to end the war and change aviation forever. But there was a catch. Deep inside the complex mathematics of its rigid rotor system, there was a ghost. A hidden instability. A fatal flaw that didn't just make the aircraft difficult to fly, it made it a death trap. This is the story of the Lockheed AH-56 Cheyenne. The helicopter that was too fast, too powerful, and too dangerous to exist. Welcome to Shadowworks. To understand why the Cheyenne was built, you have to understand the meat grinder of 1965. The United States was wading deeper into the jungles of Vietnam, and the helicopter had become the workhorse of the war. The Bell UH-1 Iroquois, the Huey, was the icon of the conflict. It was rugged, reliable, and beloved by the troops. But it was also a sitting duck. The Huey had a top speed of about 120 knots, or 140 miles per hour. In a dive, with a tailwind, maybe you could push it to 150. But when loaded with troops and ammo, it was slow. And in modern warfare, slow means dead. The Viet Cong learned quickly that if they led their aim just right, they could knock a Huey out of the sky with small arms fire. The U.S. Army realized they needed something else. They didn't just need a transport, they needed a hunter. They needed a dedicated attack helicopter to escort the Hueys and suppress enemy fire. But when engineers sat down to design a faster helicopter, they ran into a wall. A wall made of air. It's a phenomenon called retreating blade stall, and it is the demon that haunts every helicopter designer. Here is the physics of the problem. When a helicopter flies forward, its rotor blades are spinning. On the right side of the aircraft, the blade is moving forward into the wind. This is the advancing blade. It gets extra lift because the speed of the blade is added to the speed of the aircraft. But on the left side, the blade is swinging backward. This is the retreating blade. It is moving away from the wind. As the helicopter flies faster, that retreating blade effectively sees less and less air. Eventually, if you fly fast enough, the air flowing over the retreating blade drops to zero. When that happens, the blade stops generating lift. It stalls. The right side of the helicopter is still lifting, but the left side just... Let's go. The helicopter violently rolls over and crashes. For conventional helicopters, this aerodynamic speed limit is around 200 miles per hour. You cannot go faster. Physics says no. Shutterstock. But the US Army didn't care about physics. They issued a requirement for the Advanced Aerial Fire Support System, or AAFSS. They wanted a machine that could cruise at 240 miles per hour, dash at 250, and carry a weapon load that rivaled a B-17 bomber. They were asking for the impossible. And the only company crazy enough to say yes was a company that had never built a helicopter before. Lockheed. Lockheed was royalty in the aerospace world. They were the wizards of the skunk works. They built the U-2 spy plane. They built the SR-71 Blackbird the fastest plane in history. They were used to solving impossible aerodynamic problems with brute force and genius engineering. When they looked at the AAFSS contract, they decided to throw out the rulebook. They wouldn't build a helicopter, they would build a hybrid, a mutant. Their design was designated the AH-56 Cheyenne, and it looked like nothing else on Earth. First, they gave it wings, 
stubby, wide cord wings that spanned nearly 27 feet. The idea was simple. At high speeds, the rotor wouldn't need to provide all the lift. The wings would take over, carrying the weight of the aircraft, just like an airplane. This would offload the rotor, delaying that deadly retreating blade stall. Second, they added a propeller. Not on the front, but on the back. Sitting right behind the tail rotor was a massive, three-bladed pusher propeller. This was the secret weapon. In a hover, the Cheyenne used its main rotor like a normal helicopter. But once it transitioned to forward flight, the pilot could engage that pusher prop. It was like hitting the afterburner. The main rotor would flatten out, barely doing any work, while that rear propeller shoved the aircraft forward at speeds that made other pilots dizzy. But the real revolution, and the real danger, was in the rotor head itself. Standard helicopters have articulated rotors. The blades are hinged. They flap up and down to compensate for aerodynamics. It's a flexible, forgiving system. It's like driving a car with soft suspension. Lockheed said, no. They built a rigid rotor. The blades were bolted solid to the mast made of titanium. They didn't flap. They didn't hinge. They were stiff, unyielding, and incredibly responsive. Imagine the difference between steering a bus and driving a Formula One car. That was the rigid rotor. It gave the pilot instant twitchy control. It allowed the helicopter to perform loops and rolls that would snap a Huey in half. It was a system designed for a fighter pilot, but there was a reason nobody else used rigid rotors. They were unforgiving. They transferred every vibration, every shock, and every aerodynamic anomaly directly into the airframe. To tame this beast, Lockheed installed a gyroscope on top of the rotor, a mechanical computer that spun above the blades to stabilize the aircraft. It was the most complex mechanical system ever put on a helicopter. It was a watchmaker's masterpiece inside a sledgehammer. And in 1967, they turned it on. When the Cheyenne first took to the air, it was awe-inspiring. It was massive, 55 feet long. It stood on tall, retractable landing gear like a predatory bird. And it was fast. In testing, the Cheyenne easily broke the 200-mile-per-hour barrier. Then 220, then 240. It topped out at over 250 miles per hour in level flight. In a dive, it could break 280. It was leaving Cessna airplanes in the dust. It could keep up with WW2 Mustangs. For the Army pilots testing it, it was a revelation. The rigid rotor system meant that when you moved the stick, the helicopter moved now. There was no lag. It felt solid, aggressive, and the weapon system was straight out of science fiction. The gunner sat in the front in a swiveling chair that was mechanically linked to a periscope sight. The entire gunner's station could rotate 360 degrees inside the cockpit. If he looked left, the turret under the nose, a 30mm automatic cannon, snapped to the left. If he looked right, the minigun in the belly turret followed his eyes. It also had a computer targeting system, a laser rangefinder, and night vision. In 1967, this was like handing a caveman an iPhone. The army was in love. They ordered 375 of them before testing was even finished. They were already painting United States Army on the tails. They dubbed it the king of the battlefield. But the king had a weakness. Aerodynamics is a cruel mistress. You can cheat her for a while, but eventually she collects her debt. As flight testing continued, pilots began to report something disturbing. At certain speeds and during certain maneuvers, the Cheyenne would shudder. It wasn't a normal vibration. It was a rhythmic, violent oscillation. The rotor blades, despite being rigid, would start to flex. The gyroscope on top would try to correct it, but sometimes the correction would be slightly out of phase with the vibration. Instead of smoothing out the bump, the system would amplify it. Engineers called it the half-P hop. It was a harmonic instability. It occurred once every two revolutions of the rotor, one-two-P. Imagine a shopping cart with a wobbly wheel. At slow speeds, it's annoying. At high speeds, the wheel shakes so violently it threatens to tear the cart apart. That is what was happening to the 2,000-pound titanium rotor system of the Cheyenne. Lockheed engineers scrambled. They tweaked the gyroscope. They adjusted the control stiffness. They added dampeners. They thought they had fixed it. On March 12, 1969, test pilot David Beale took a modified Cheyenne up for a routine test flight. He was one of the best. 
He had flown the aircraft dozens of times. The mission was to test the stability of the rotor system. Beale put the helicopter into a test maneuver. He moved the stick to induce a vibration, expecting the systems to dampen it out. But this time, the dampeners failed. The rotor didn't stabilize. It began to oscillate. The giant composite blades started to flap wildly, defying their rigid mounts. The half p hop returned, but this time it was a feedback loop of destruction. Within seconds, the oscillation became so violent that the pilot lost control. The rotor disc tilted aggressively aft and right. In a horrifying instant, the tips of the main rotor blades flexed downward. They flexed so far that they struck the tail boom of the helicopter. Then, in the next revolution, they sliced through the canopy. The aircraft disintegrated in midair. David Beale was killed instantly. The crash sent a shockwave through the Pentagon. The safest, most advanced helicopter in the world had just killed its pilot because of a fundamental flaw in its design philosophy. Lockheed argued it was a fixable problem. They said it was a software bug in a hardware world. They proposed stiffer blades, new control geometries. But the illusion of invincibility was shattered. If physics was the first assassin of the Cheyenne, politics was the second. While Lockheed struggled to fix the rotor, the United States Air Force was watching, and they were jealous. The Air Force looked at the Cheyenne, and they didn't see a helicopter. They saw a ground attack aircraft. They saw a machine that could fly fast, carry bombs, and do the job of their A-1 Sky Raiders and A-10 Warthogs. The Key West Agreement of 1948 had drawn a line in the sand. The Army flies helicopters. The Air Force flies fixed-wing combat aircraft. The Air Force argued that the Cheyenne, with its wings and pusher prop, was functionally a fixed-wing plane. They claimed the army was infringing on their territory. They launched a political war in Congress, lobbying to kill the Cheyenne program to protect their own budget for the AX program, which became the A-10. Meanwhile, the army was getting impatient. The Vietnam War was raging, and the Cheyenne was years behind schedule. They needed gunships now. They had already deployed the Bell AH-1 Cobra as an interim solution. The Cobra was slower, lighter, and simpler. But it worked. It didn't have a rigid rotor. It didn't have a pusher prop. It didn't try to rewrite the laws of physics. It just killed targets. The final nail in the coffin came in 1972. Lockheed finally claimed they had solved the instability. They demonstrated a new control system that eliminated the half-p hop. But it was too late. The cost of the program had ballooned. The political pressure was insurmountable. On August 9, 1972, the Army cancelled the AH-56 Cheyenne. It was the end of the road for the most ambitious helicopter ever built. Five hundred million dollars had been spent. A pilot had died. And not a single Cheyenne ever fired a shot in anger. The Cheyenne was a failure, but it was a successful failure. From the ashes of the Cheyenne program, the Army learned a valuable lesson. Complexity is the enemy of survival. They launched a new competition for an advanced attack helicopter. But this time, they asked for something simpler. No pusher props, no rigid rotors, just a flying tank. That competition produced the Hughes YR-64, which became the Apache. The Apache is slower than the Cheyenne. It has shorter range. But it is stable, reliable, and it works. However, the ghost of the Cheyenne is still with us. Look at the modern battlefield today. The Army is once again looking for high-speed vertical lift. Look at the Sikorsky Raider X and the Defiant X. Look at their rotors, rigid rotors. Look at their tails, pusher propellers. Fifty years later, we are finally building the machine Lockheed tried to build in 1967. Materials science and computer flight controls have finally caught up to the vision. We can now tame the instability that killed David Beale. The Cheyenne wasn't a bad idea. It was just a time traveler. It was a machine from the 21st century trying to exist in a world of slide rules and analog servos. It was a victim of its own ambition. In the end, the Cheyenne remains a warning to engineers everywhere. You can push the envelope. You can break the records. But you can never, ever ignore the physics. Because in the shadow works of military aviation, the line between a breakthrough and a disaster is razor thin. And sometimes, the only way to find that line is to cross it. I'm Shadowworks.
If you enjoyed this deep dive into the archives of failed engineering, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Next week, we are looking at the Soviet attempt to build a flying aircraft carrier that ended in a ball of fire. You don't want to miss it. Check out this video on the screen right now about the Soviet Caspian Sea Monster, another giant that flew too close to the water. Clear your baffles. I'll see you in the next one.